Hello friends of Jesus, it's yet another morning that we thank the Lord for being with us. He has led us through the past weeks and this is another week that we see his providence. My name is Brother Edward Mtinda and I appreciate for everyone who has been listening to the audios and even for the responses, the comments, the questions and even the clarifications that people are seeking. Yeah, allow me just to introduce the theme for the audios. Our theme is based on the book of Revelation 14, verses number 6. And we are just trying to analyze that text, even in the context of those who are supposed to give the message, as well as those who are supposed to receive the message. And therefore, I welcome all of you to today's presentation. We are at Audio 21. The Laudation Message, Part 3. Allow me to pray and then we proceed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and we thank you for being with us. We also thank you for your leadings, even in the past audios. And even today as we begin another week in our recordings, Lord, be with us. For those of us who have joined, Lord, bless them even as they begin this series of study. Be with us and bless us. This is our prayer through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I begin with today's audio, I will just do a clarification. There is a question that has cropped up in audio number 16. And one of our friends was asking if, if the tree that Zacchaeus had climbed, was it a fig tree or a sycamore tree. Now, if you go to the book of Luke 19, Luke 19, just a clarification. Luke 19, verses number one, the Bible says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was a little of stature. Verses number four, the Bible says, and he ran before him and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Now in the book of Luke, Luke is recording that it is the sycamore tree that Zacchaeus climbed. But again, I want to, to let you know something that the Bible does not record every other detail but it just gives the fundamental principles and it is left for you and I to search. Now, for us to understand was it a sycamore tree or a fig tree, the best thing could be we ask ourselves, what is a sycamore tree? Now, if you go back to the botanical world, you'll find that a sycamore tree, the botanical name for sycamore is Ficus sycomorus. Ficus sycomorus. Now, if you study about trees, you realize that Ficus sycomorus, when it is translated to English, or the English name for that botanical name is Sycamo fig. So the Bible just says that he climbed a sycamore tree, but now if you do an analysis and investigation on that tree, you realize that Ficus sycomorus is one of the species of the fig tree. And therefore, the tree that... Zacchaeus climbed is one of the species of the fig tree. Then the other clarification that one had sought for was who climbed or who, who did Jesus find on the fig tree? Was it Philip or was it Nathaniel? Now you go to John 1 48. John 1 48. The good thing about the Bible, the Bible is the only book that can answer all questions that humanity has. Now, John 1, 48, the Bible says, Nathanael saith unto him, that is John 1, 48, Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Then you can notice how John ties with verses number 49, Nathanael answered. So it is a conversation between Christ and Christ. And Nathaniel, and Christ is telling Nathaniel, even before Philip saw thee, I saw thee under the fig tree. 
maybe there was a slip of tongue where we said that on that tree it was Philip, but the Bible is clear that it was Nathaniel. So you can do maybe that correction in your notes. Now I want us to proceed to audio number 21 and just allow me to do a short prayer and then we proceed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the questions and even the clarifications that were sought for. And now as we proceed with the discourse, Lord be with us, guide us and teach us. This is our prayer through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you can listen to audio number 19 and number 20 so that you can have a good foundation even as we continue to build up on the laudation message part number three we have come through this presentation from audio one as we are trying to describe god's people and how they are to give this message and in fact in revelation 14 verses number six the bible said that and i saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven and we identified that these are god's people who are identified as angels or messengers and again the bible says that they were flying that means they had been raised above the earth. And that aspect, if you run it throughout the Bible, you realize that it is Jerusalem, God's people, Sabbath keepers, who had some doctrines that they were given by Jehovah. These are the individuals who were, who were escalated above the earth. And God is saying that they were to have the gospel and then give that gospel. But one of the things that stands as a barrier for them giving that message is the condition that they are in. And in fact, that condition is recorded in the book of Revelation 3, verse 14. Listen to that text again. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laudations write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Christ is saying he desired that the church was not lukewarm. And Christ is saying it is better it was cold. And we looked at the principles of being cold, that when, when one was cold in the Bible, they would seek for heat. And then Christ again said that, I wish you were hot. Now in the book of Romans, in the book of Romans, in the book of Romans, yeah, because again, I will not repeat every other principle that we had already laid down, but one of the principles that came out so clearly is that when one was hot, they were fervent. Now, I want us to build our presentation in Romans 12 verse 11. What does it mean to be fervent? The Bible says, Romans 12 verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So here Paul is saying that when one is fervent, they are not slothful. And when they are not slothful, they are serving the Lord. So one of the things that has led the church to be lukewarm, to be laudation, it is because they do not possess heat. They are not fervent. They are not doing service to the Lord, and therefore the Bible says that they are slothful. Now, I want us to take this word slothful in the Old Testament, and specifically the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 19, verses number 15. Listen to what the Bible says. It is an interesting portion of scripture. The Bible says, slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep. So if the church is slothful, then it means that the church has fallen into a deep sleep. Then the Bible says, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Now we want to identify two things that are connected to slothfulness. Number one, deep sleep. Number two, hunger. And therefore the church is suffering from deep sleep and it is suffering from hunger because they are slothful. What does it mean to be in deep sleep? Now that word deep sleep has a couple of meanings in the Bible. But one of the aspects of deep, deep sleep that can be used in this context 
is found in the book of Genesis. What transpires when one is in deep sleep? So the church is not awake. The church is in deep sleep. What does it mean to be in deep sleep? Now notice Genesis 15, verses number 12. The Bible says, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Notice what the Bible will say, And lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. When God's people are not serving the Lord, when they are slothful in business, when they are not fervent in spirit, Solomon says in the book of Proverbs, a deep sleep will fall upon them. Then afterwards, they will experience a hunger. And here the Bible says that when deep sleep falls upon you, darkness, darkness falls upon you. So where there is deep sleep, there is darkness. And you and I understand one principle in creation. Darkness is the absence of light. So a good question could be, where does light come from? Because light and darkness, they do not dwell together. So when we have darkness, do not have light. So darkness is the absentia of light. So in God's church, there is a deficiency of light. But where does light proceed from? What is the source of light? The church is lacking the source of light, which is to illuminate their path. What is this source of light? Go to the book of Second Peter. Second Peter. The church is lacking an important aspect that was to give light to the church. And because it is lacking, darkness has fallen upon them. Now, Second Peter 1.19, the Bible says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, where unto you do well, that ye take heed as unto a light. Now, here Peter is equating prophecy unto a light. And the church has fallen into a deep sleep they have been covered with darkness because they no longer have the light. And the light that God had given to the church, it was to proceed from the prophetic message. It was to proceed from his servants, the prophets. So the church is no longer studying prophetic messages, and therefore the church has fallen into a deep sleep. And in fact, when you have fallen into a deep sleep, your eyes are closed. You do not see. You do not have vision. And we are coming to that point. But listen to this verse. We also have a more sure word of prophecy. Where unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day down and the day star arise in your hearts. The prophetic message was to illuminate the path. It was to, to cause a light to shine upon our path. And as we were walking in this pathway, in this way mark, we were to come to a point where the day will down and the day star, and in geography we understand that the day star is the sun, the sun was to arise in our hearts and that sun is our Lord Jesus Christ. So the church cannot be enabled to see Christ in his second coming because they no longer have the torch, the lamp that is to lead them to the Savior, to the Redeemer, because the prophetic message has been ignored. There is an assumption that we no longer need it. And in fact, the Bible said that when you are slothful, you have fallen into a deep sleep. I will deal with hunger tomorrow. Now, when one is sleeping in a deep sleep, one of the things that we have seen is that their eyes are closed. And when your eyes are closed, you don't have visions and it is so beautiful when you study the natural and then now you begin comparing with the spiritual where there is no vision solomon says something proverbs 29 proverbs 29 verses number 18 proverbs 29 verses number 18 the bible says where there is no vision the people perish 
And as we bring this message to a close, just allow me to explain this text. Where there is no vision, the people perish. For us to have a clear understanding of this text, you just take this text and you place it in a context where there was no vision. And then we see, how did people perish? Because visions are usually given to prophets, if you read the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, verses number 6, the Bible says, And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak him unto him in a dream. You can as well read in your own time Hosea 12, verses number 10, where the Lord says, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and, multi and, and given similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. So anytime God will communicate to the prophets, he will employ the use of visions. Now back to the text. Solomon is saying, where there is no vision, a people perish. No vision, no seer. A seer is a prophet. So it is a prophet who was to see, it is a prophet who was to be given the vision, but the church does not have vision. Now, if you take this into history, you will realize that in all ages, beginning with Adam, there were prophets. God had to raise a prophet in every successive generation. But there is a generation which was about 400 years, and we had no prophet. And that is the time period from Malachi to John the Baptist. It is a gap of 400 years. There was no prophet for 400 years. And in these 400 years, the kingdom that was ruling the earth was the Grecian Empire led by Alexander the Great. And you study about this kingdom, you realize that it is the kingdom that brought about maxims, traditions, customs, and there was a lot of teachings which was based on false philosophy. So what are we trying to say? Where there is no vision, where there is no prophetic messages, it is philosophy which shall fill the minds of men. And you study that history of 400 years. Men had gone out of the light. They had separated themselves from the source of light. And all they believed in was human theories and human thoughts. And therefore, the absence of light is equals to the faith that men build upon men. Human thoughts are elevated and God is removed from the sight. So therefore, friends, as John, the Sea of Patmos, was looking at the church, at the end stage, at the Laudation people, he saw different aspects that have led the church to be lukewarm, not to be fervent, to have fallen in deep sleep. And this should be our prayer. Go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Or rather John chapter 9. Go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Verses number 4. I want us to see what should be our prayer, what should be our plea unto God, because already we are in this condition. Our plea should be the plea that is found in the book of John, chapter 9, verses number 4, where Christ is saying, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The Bible shows that Christ met a blind man and the context of John chapter 9 is an experience that the blind man had when he met with Jesus. And in fact, the Bible says 9.6, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Christ is thinking 
to anoint our eyes again that we may see. And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation means sent. He went his way therefore and washed, and coming, seeing. The Bible shows that the only way that we can see again is when Christ will anoint our eyes. And this should be our prayer. This should be the prayer of every other child of God, whether they be man, woman, child, or a young person. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the experience that you want us to develop. Lord, you are always seeking to touch our eyes and also to anoint them, that we may come out from that blind condition, from that laudation condition. And even as we continue to listen to these presentations, Lord, now we are willing to become part of you. And for a long time, we have been in deep sleep, in darkness. Lord, we have ignored the study of the prophetic messages. But now, Lord, we are asking that you may cause a revival in our hearts. Lord, quicken us and Lord, strengthen us that, Lord, that zeal that was before, that zeal that was initiated when the church was being set up. Lord, bring it back again. Restore us again. And even this week, Lord, we place it upon your hands, direct our paths, our thoughts, our ideas, and even everything that we shall actuate. Be with us and bless us. This is our prayer through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. If you have any question, you can just hit my inbox in WhatsApp. You can call me, you can text me. And again, God will bless us. God be with you and bless you wherever you are.